So can everybody see my screen okay? If you're good, you know, just kind of say yay or something in the chat. Yay. Cool. All right. Perfect. That's that's excellent. <laughs> okay, so um so this is our website, JavaScript LA, and you can get here by just going to javascriptla.net. Uh, go here for mainly like the newest information, uh, new meetup information. We started off as a meetup group in LA, and then you know for the last like four years or so, we've been running it both in LA and then Orange County later. And uh, after the quarantine, you know, before the quarantine happened, actually, we were already starting to do things online. We had a YouTube channel, um, we had Slack, we had uh, Discord. And so we were, we didn't know that a quarantine was coming, but we were kind of, you know, thinking about being online because we know that a lot of people are interested in checking out our videos, as you can see on this YouTube channel. That's something we did consistently. And, um, you know, we just posted our videos to YouTube and then that way more people were able to see uh, our meetup presentations even after they finished. And so you can go here if you want and you can subscribe. Um, there are a lot of great videos that you can watch. Um, it's not just meetup videos. Um, from time to time, I will record videos as well. And so like I made a playlist called Intro to React, which you can check out if you're interested. Um, it has, you know, four basic intro parts as well as 12 uh, movie project parts. So you can learn how to build a basic movie search project with React. And I think that's a pretty cool project if you're in React newbie. Um, we also have these other playlists, um, some of our best React presentations. You can go back and watch them. Uh, ES6, I know a lot of people ask about ES6 and, you know, how to use it compared to ES5. So you can check out these videos. Uh, we also have some how to do stuff. And so, you know, for some of the speakers too here that are going to be presenting, if you do want to collaborate or send us a video, we'd be happy to like put it up on our channel, help you get some more exposure. Um, and then same thing, you know, if you're a newbie or anybody trying to learn, tell us what you want to learn and we'll help you, uh, you know, do things uh, more than just JavaScript. You can also learn full stack engineering. That's kind of like a new thing that we're doing. Uh, so make sure you follow us on the YouTube channel. And then um, I think a lot of people came here from Instagram. So I'll just uh, point that out as well. Uh, Instagram seems to be pretty popular for us. You can just go to Instagram.com slash JavaScript Ninja. And um, that should show you kind of like the latest talks and latest um, meetup stuff uh, pretty much in a simple photo. I like Instagram for that reason because it's just really easy to look at real quick and get a sense of what's coming up. So these are my favorite things. A lot of people like Slack and Discord, so I do recommend going there and checking that out as well if you're a person who likes to chat. And I'll just bring that up really quickly too. So um, JavaScript Ninja, you can come on our team channel and just basically um, you know, chat with a lot of people, ask questions. Uh, I think we have a lot of React questions and React Native questions, so feel free to go in here and ask. And then, uh, like I said, we do have Slack, and so I'll bring that up as well. So this is the Slack channel and it looks like we have a, somebody messaged me, oh, Talia messaged me. So I'll message you back Talia pretty soon. Um, but yeah, you know, feel free to join those chat channels. You can chat on there if you want for tonight, but I do recommend you use the actual chat for the, um, uh, for the Zoom meeting because that is something I'm gonna be paying more attention to anyway. All right, so I uh, hope that made sense. If you, again, if you have any questions, let me know and I'd be happy to help you out on any social medium, you can contact me. Um, and then, you know, if you wanna check out any slides, you can also go to the meetup slides that I have here. It's under, um, you know, about speak for us and then meetup slides. And I'm gonna be referencing my slide tonight from slides.com to just JavaScript delay. And I'll be talking about intro to yarn. Um, so with that, I'm going to return back to the main area and uh, we'll just kind of continue to check out everybody coming in. Okay, um, while we are waiting for everybody, one more time, does anybody else want to make any quick announcements? I know some people are here from, um, you know, especially the speakers. Um, this is your chance to kind of jump in and like, you know, just talk about yourself. So be sure to do that real quick. Uh, sure, I'll jump in. Uh, my name is David. I'm a I'm a React developer, and I just like to meet more people who are into React. And like I I, I want to get like a study club going. 
So yeah, I've been talking to VJ and like, <laughs> I think it'd be cool to get like a regular group of people who can regularly talk about React. Uh, I am Steven. Uh, I am primarily a backend developer. I dabble just a little bit in the front end of JavaScript and stuff. So I may not know as much as everybody else here. I don't do large projects. I am more of what you'd call an API ninja. Uh, but I do enjoy JavaScript and any project that comes along that we can take advantage of that. We do. I do like to play around with it. Um, I can go. I'm Talia. I'm a dev advocate at Split. Um, and I actually just moved back to LA. So I'm looking to get connected with the developer community here. Um, so that's why I joined this group. So thanks for having me. Hey, I'm Dave. Um, I work at Beachbody as a lead engineer. I'm a front end engineer there, but I'm actually a full stack guy. Ruby on Rails background. I've done some work in PHP, a little bit in Java. Um, right now I'm playing with Flutter and Dart. So that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Uh, my name's Robbie. I'm a, mostly a backend developer. I do maybe 15% front end, uh, mostly in Angular these days, sometimes React. Uh, and uh, I really like these uh, JavaScript meetups because, because I'm not a full-time front end developer. Uh, I, it, uh, it really helps me uh, pick up little tricks and I think I learn something in every meetup I come to or attend. So the same as me then. Yeah, but I don't have a cool background like you have. <laughs> Found this one on Reddit. I think the guy said it took two weeks to photo, uh, to take the photos of the moon and then map it out onto a 3D globe and then render it together. All right, yeah. Anybody else want to go? Uh, I'll go. Sorry. Um, I just had to package at the door. But um, I'm, uh, I'm Rowan. I'm a React developer. And I work at a company called uh, Sure Prep, which are we're a tax software company. So I'm interested in uh, learning new technologies, um, learning new approaches, just anything that that anyone had, like any ideas that anyone has. It's always interesting to hear, and you can learn a lot from a lot of different people. So I'm excited to be here. It's been a while, VJ. Um, hey. Haven't haven't had a chance to to network in quite some time. Um, my name's CJ. I'm actually the program manager at Learning Fuse. Uh, we're a coding boot camp down in Orange County. And so uh, where we had, uh, you know, kind of crossed paths typically was in the networking scene and actually seeing people in person. So anytime I see events nowadays, I'm like, ooh, an event going on. And I like try to jump in and make sure uh, I'm available. So I'm actually trying to get some students on as well right now. We'll see. Perfect. And actually, we, um, we did a shout out for you um, you know, the Scott Bowler video that uh, we did on React was pretty cool. And it's been gaining a lot of views on YouTube. It's almost at 10,000. So um, I made like a summary post the other day and uh, I put it on Medium and I got like almost like 100 people clapping about it. And I mentioned Scott in that particular post. So I'll send it afterwards. You might yeah. want to check it out. That would be awesome. And we'll, uh, we'll get our marketing team to, to pump that out as well, get you some more claps. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, let's see. I got a few more people joining. Does anybody else want to go in? Hey, yeah. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm Dana. I've been uh, going to uh, JavaScript LA meetups since uh, late last year. Um, I'm a pretty new developer, so I'm still looking for my first opportunity. So if anybody knows any leads that I should follow, just uh, let me know. I'm a React developer, uh, full stack developer. Um, my name is Adrian Tech. I am a developer advocate for MongoDB. Um, I spoke once before uh, for JavaScript LA uh, last year in person, um, but I have been a C Sharp developer for most of my career and um, happy to get more, um, learn more about JavaScript in general, just vanilla JavaScript. I don't want to get into the framework wars yet. <laughs> Um, but uh, the one thing I actually did want to share is if anybody is interested in Animal Crossing and DevOps, oh, yeah. there is yeah, a yeah. conference going on that's completely free and they're streaming that on Twitch. And I'm actually speaking at that conference, so that's going to be pretty cool. That is so cool. So uh, I hope you guys want to tune in and yeah. see how that goes. I've, I've never heard of anything like that, but it should be fun. So, um, And I can post the link later and show you guys. Yeah, please do. That's that's like the coolest thing I've ever heard in Animal Crossing um, <laughs> meetup. <laughs> that's awesome. So how does it connect DevOps with Animal Crossing? 
A lot of uh, DevOps uh, practitioners and engineers, they, you know, uh, everybody is on the Animal Crossing train. I certainly am. And they're like, well, what would it take to combine the two? And they're like, I don't know, that'd be a crazy idea. And so they kept talking about it. And then this person who's hosting it um, went on his Twitch stream, uh, tried to see if anybody was interested. A lot of people were interested. So he did the formal thing like a conference. He put out an open call for papers. Uh, essentially anything DevOps related um, was uh, you know, fair game. And if you could try to get more creative with um, matching it to Animal Crossing, you had a better chance. Uh, but yeah, and he, he, he just kind of chose whatever was, was fitting in, in between the creativity of Animal um, Crossing and DevOps. And yeah, now, now it's a thing. So <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah. I, I wanted to learn more about DevOps, so this might be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, feel free. I, I posted the link in the chat. I think I sent it. Yeah, I sent it to everybody. So Perfect. feel free to check yeah. it out. Love it. <laughs> That's so cool. Okay, so we have a few uh, people in the chat introducing themselves. Um, I want to just scroll up a little quick just so I can see who uh, introduced themselves. So we have Dwayne. Um, he's an SQL database engineer. Um, he says this video is acting up, but he's here to learn about backend opportunities. And then let's see here. We have Denny. Denny is an architect from Pacific Life. He's, introduced, he's interested in learning about design systems with React. Um, then let's see here. Um, we also have the, uh, hopefully I'm not saying your name wrong, Vyacheslav um, Bikmudov. Um, I am Slava, CTO of Tulu.LA. We build IT with React and GraphQL. Oh, very cool. And then uh, we have Steam, Steve Ham, and he's from Colorado. So thanks for joining us from Colorado. That's awesome. Um, but he found the group on meetup.com and just wanted to learn about JS. And um, he's also a PHP developer and he has some experience with the view and node. So very cool. All right, um, so it looks like we got sort of introductions out of the way. Um, if anybody else does wanna like make a shout out or some kind of introduction, uh, you can do so in the chat as you see here. Uh, but we are going to go ahead and get started with the meetups now. So um, let's then go with Rowan using TypeScript on a Greenfield project. Everybody hands a uh, round of applause, please. There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can yeah, see it. Can. Cool. Um, hopefully it's the presentation, not the other 5,000 things I've opened. And by the way, before you start, I'm going to mute everybody just for personal etiquette, right? Um, when somebody's speaking, don't speak while they're speaking. Just keep your uh, mic on mute and then use the chat channel to ask questions. When the speaker is finished presenting, then you can actually go ahead and make a um, you can turn on your mic. All right, cool. Script and React, and basically my experiences uh, with TypeScript and React together. Um, I guess first of all, just in case anyone doesn't know what TypeScript is, TypeScript is basically a superset of JavaScript that adds optional static typing to JavaScript, which just means that TypeScript is like ex it extends JavaScript and it makes basically makes uh, typing static. So. Um, as everyone may or may not know, in JavaScript, uh, when you declare a var variable, it's dynamically typed, which means it could be a number, it could be a string, uh, it could be an object. And basically what TypeScript does for that is that you can constrain it to something. So if you say this random string has to be a string in the future, if, um, you wouldn't possibly be able to reassign that to a uh, number, like if you're using R and not const, sorry, just habits. But you can also do really cool stuff like uh, typing in the parameters of functions. So you can say, hey, this uh, add function can only take in two numbers. And so if anyone actually put in a string, it would uh, throw an error. So I, I first got into TypeScript uh, at the, around September of last year. Uh, it was because we were starting on a Greenfield project at my company and um, it was completely new another developer and I were starting on it and we were looking at the best technologies to implement in a new project. And TypeScript was definitely one of the things that we were interested in learning and heard it had provided a lot of benefits. So we just went ahead with it. We uh, didn't know any TypeScript at all. Um, we just read the docs for a couple of days and then we just started on a new project. And so there was a lot of different experiences that came out of just diving 
so headstrong, just deep into TypeScript from the very start. Our initial difficulties included uh, the most painful ones, probably setting up the dev environment. Um, Webpack, integrating TypeScript with ESLint, Jest, Babel, and TSConfig. Um, just our TSConfig on the right, um, just looking through all the documentations for that. It's definitely not something that you would have to do initially, learning TypeScripts, um, but we wanted a very custom uh, app. And I would suggest if anyone was going to play with TypeScript by themselves on their own, you just use create react app and then just use the TypeScript template. You can avoid all of this. But since it was a company project, um, we wanted to have control over everything. So it took a while to set that up. Um, after we had after we had all of that set up, we also learned how to debug type errors, especially from third party libraries. So um, if everyone anyone's ever seen a TypeScript error, um, it looks very, very, very wordy. It's very long depending on what the type is and learning how to read that, understand it, and to figure out what the problem was, um, it definitely took a while. We uh, used material UI components and just learning all those types and trying to figure it out and learning all the React types, uh, it was one of the biggest issues uh, that we had initially, just that was slowing down development. But granted, after we got uh, through all of that, TypeScript really started paying off around the second month or so. Um, I could, I, we could really see the benefits of it. Um, development became so much faster, and uh, it basically made our coding cleaner and I think more scalable. Uh, TypeScript made us document our functions. Um, we used strict mode, so we had to type everything. So all of our functions had types, so we knew what to put into them when we were using them. All of our API calls, we typed them uh, very strictly, so we know how to handle those errors. And it made it so much easier to do code reviews because now code reviews read basically like a documentation. So you could trust other developers more and you knew that if it compiled, it pretty much ran unless there was some uh, random API error that was beyond our control. And it reduced our bugs by a sig significant per percentage. So um, I would say at least 80%. So Basically, in conclusion, I would suggest anyone who's interested in learning TypeScript, it's a steep learning curve for a new project if you're, start, if you're gonna start at a company, but it's definitely worth it. I would definitely do it over again, and it was worth every single second I put into it, and now I can't live without it. All right, very cool. Round of applause, please. All right. Um, okay, so looks like we had a question. Somebody asked, uh, what is your dev environment? That was from Dwayne. Um, we use uh, Webpack, of course, uh, with React, Babel, um, Jest for testing, and let me think. Yeah, I think that's basically it. So we had a bunch of issues with, uh, we had to learn how Babel compiles uh, TypeScript to JavaScript and how that would work with the TypeScript compiler uh, and to make sure that it didn't uh, conflict with each other or it didn't type, it didn't check more than once. So we really wanted to optimize the um, how, you know, the hot, like the hot reloading and uh, all of that stuff, just a bunch of things meshing in between each other. And then the ESLint was a little difficult because um, there's also TypeScript checking and ESLint checking. So we, we ended up using TypeScript ESLint. And yeah, there was issues with that too that we had to debug. But once it, get, it works, it works so well. And um, let's see what else was there. Also, absolute paths, we needed to have, uh, we needed import absolute paths, and then we had like to have different versions of it in the web pack and the TS config. So yeah, just okay. a bunch of little things. All right, very cool. There's a couple more questions. Uh, feel free to uh, answer them in the chat. I'm gonna go on to the next presenter. So the next presenter is David Lai, and he's going to be talking about React Hooks. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David. I'm a uh, React Native slash uh, GraphQL developer. Um, so my talk is on, yeah, it said React Hooks and kind of more specifically uh, some of the pain I went through trying to implement a uh, debounce hook, uh, a debounce search hook. You guys see okay. my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you guys want the code to, the, to, to this talk, you can uh, go here. I'll paste it into the chat. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, with, I would say just like open up, um, open up the libs folder, and then you can kind of follow along here. 
for the most part. Uh, so what I have is, um, so I just have a simple, like, let's say we're implementing a search, right? I'm going to open up the console. I, I have some like logging statements on the fake API calls and you can kind of notice like right now I'm starting off with a, uh, so this is what the app, what the simple app does. It's like you can, it's a type as you search. So I can in a log, it'll, it'll just log the API calls. So this is starting off with just using a simple use state. Uh, of course, you know, you don't, you don't want to hit the API like every time that someone hits a key, right? So let's say someone's typing like, you know, Targaryen, you don't want to like hit the API a dozen times. So, so that's kind of the idea of uh, debouncing it. But one of the problems I hit while debouncing it was I, I, I first tried it just using a simple like adding low, low dash debounce and it did not work exactly like I expected to. So, so here's my sort of kind of a, what I did before when I tried to use low dash. So I used the debounce from low dash to just wrap the function that debounced the, the API call. So what the problem I had here was, you know, when I, when I used the, Maybe I should rewind. Uh, should I do you need me to explain some of the basic hook building blocks? Uh, just go go as you are. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. Just, just a quick uh, so use state. You know, basically same as it is, it kind of store state, and then use effect works like an observer. So if you want to do things that just observes value, those are kind of the two main building blocks. And then I'll introduce use ref later. Um, so yeah. So my first attempt at doing like a debounce search hook was I just wrapped the function in debounce. But one of the problems about functional components, unlike like, like class components, is it gets read, it, this whole function runs on every render. So you see, you notice a problem here, this debounce search function will get rerun. So even though it, it's inside a use effect, it's getting redefined in the outer scope. Um, so let me demonstrate the problem. So I'm going to just uncomment or comment out the one where I'm just using use state and use it. Use, using debounce, uh, using, using the wrong way. So, no, so I'm going to clear out the console. So look at, notice the counts console log. The debounce function works, but it's actually getting called multiple times because it's get, because the debounce function is getting redefined at every render. You notice that? Yeah, you have yeah. Um, about 15 seconds left though. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, okay. If um, you wanna continue afterwards, you can. All right, uh, so how, how I fix that is there's a, there's a hook called useRef. useRef is normally used for using, getting like referencing like components directly, but another way you can use it is to store a current value that gets preserved between states of components since it's an object and not a, not a, a, not a value. So you, you, you just create a use ref, you set the current, it's the, that's the uh, sort of the, uh, what we call it, convention. So here, now I can use my uh, low dash debounce to wrap my, deb my, my search function and, and then I can use my use effect to call my Call the current on the use ref, which will call call the current one. Okay, so, David, I'm going to stop you there because we have to go on to the next presentation. But feel free to um, chat in the comment area, and then okay. uh, we'll come back. Yeah, if anyone wants time. more, I mean, like, yeah, just check out the code and you can try it out for yourself. And and then I, I wrote comments for like kind of the just kind of like how, how I explained it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great job. Um, Round of applause, please. Clap on the chat if you can too. All right, so next presentation is Talia and uh, she is going to be talking about feature flags. Okay, so give me a second to set up. This is Teddy, I used to adopt him today. Very excited. Oh, nice. You can see my screen. All right, good to go. Okay, cool. So, all right, so hi guys. 
Um, so as developers, we release features basically daily, but how do you ensure that those features are working properly in production before you release them to all of your users? If you ask me, the answer is feature flags. So a feature flag is a piece of conditional code that allows a software development team to separate code deployment from feature release. So feature flags are beneficial because they allow you to test your code in production and perform canary releases and just a ton of other things. Um, so I'm Talia. I'm a dev advocate at Split. Um, this is my contact info. Um, so the process we're going to talk about today is creating a feature flag, installing dependencies, and configuring your React app, and adding the feature flag to your code. So the first step is to create your feature flag. And the app that I'm going to be adding feature flags to in this example is a basic to-do list app. So I want to add the ability to control whether the current user um, can delete tasks. And I want to roll this functionality out in a controlled way using feature flags. So in split, the possible state of these flags, like on or off, are called treatments. And um, in this case, when the treatment is on, the user will be able to delete tasks. And when the treatment is off, the user will not be able to delete tasks. And this is what it's going to look like in each case. So in the UI, whatever UI you use, um, you can click on a button that says create split or create feature flag or whatever, um, whatever that uh, call to action is. Um, and then once you click on that, you'll be able, you'll be able to enter some details about your flag. So you'll, you'll be able to create a name, which would be something should be, that should be descriptive of what the feature flag is doing. Um, so think about what you're releasing, maybe the name of the team that owns it, maybe even include the ticket number that it's linked to on your scrum board. Um, I have another video where I go into this in a lot more detail, um, and you're welcome to look that up. It's um, feature flag maintenance and best practices. Um, but basically, the most important part here is to set up your targeting rules where you can define who will be targeted inside of your feature flag. Um, so I'm putting basically myself and the developers, and that's it, in, in the feature flag. And then everyone else is going to be sent to this default, which is off. That means that only the people who are targeted in the flag will be able to see that delete button. So the next step is to install the dependencies and to configure your app. And it's just two really easy steps. So the first one is um, to create your app with re create React app and then installing this uh, specific dependency in your root folder. And then in order to add the feature flag to our code, what you're going to do is at the top of your component, import split treatments and with split factory from split. And then basically split treatments is a React component that performs feature evaluation. And we're going to use this in our render function. And then the with split factory higher order component is used to wrap the to-do list component when I export it. And then I split up my render function in two. So in the first one, I return the treatment and the configuration from split treatments. And in the names prop, I pass in the name of my feature flag that I created from the UI. And note that this must exactly match the name that you inputted while creating your split. And then in the second render function, I created a variable named allow delete that differentiates between treatment on and off. Um, so if the treatment is on, you're allowing the user to delete the tasks. And if the treatment is off, then there's no option to delete. So then after the render functions, I insert the configuration that you will use to configure your, to configure your split instance. Um, this initializes with split factory, which is the entry point of the library. And basically how it works is that each user will have their own auth key that, that's just found in the UI. And then the key parameter is telling split who the current user is. So in this case, when you run npm start, you'll see the delete buttons because you're targeted in that flag. So like here I put me as the key and I'm targeted in that flag. So I'll see the buttons, um, the delete button. And then when I set debug to true, um, I'm able to see all the logs from split in the browser console. And then you should pay attention to two things down here. The first is that you can clearly see that I'm the person who's being targeted. And the second is that you can see that the treatment is set to on for me. So then now watch what happens when you change the key to a test user who's not in the split. Um, the delete buttons just disappear, and that's because those users are not targeted. So, and then also notice in the um, console logs that the treatment is off, and I'm now getting the default behavior because I'm logged in as someone who's not targeted, which is this test user. So that's all in my to-do list higher order component. And then in my to-do items component, I have a function called create tasks that gets called in my render function and conditionally renders the delete button if the allow delete variable is set to true. So ta-da, that's it. You've implemented a feature flag with React. So in the future, I could use this feature flag to 
um, deploy all of my changes in a controlled fashion and I could also deploy to production while keeping the flag off um, and then testing the feature in production. Um, and yeah, that's it. So again, my name is Talia. I'm on Twitter. You can email me if you have questions or, or tweet me. Um, yeah, thanks guys. All right, thank you, Talia. All right, uh, round of applause or clap in the chat. Okay, so next up we have Steven Yeager. Uh, so we're gonna give this a shot. Uh, unlike everybody else, uh, I am a PHP uh, dev uh, and I'm lazy. Uh, and I actually hate repeating code uh, and I actually prefer to um, recycle as much as possible. So a little bit about me, I am a PHP programmer. I consider myself an API ninja. I do dabble in front end. I don't have a website, but I do own two servers, but you can't hear them. I play D&D Weekly, and this is my first time doing any sort of talk, uh, so please be gentle with me. Um, so I've built uh, some code that I uh, basically use as a recyclable uh, set of APIs that I can set up really quickly to basically interact with any API out there. <clears throat> so I have a, a common folder which basically contains a handful of curl calls uh, that I do generally that I don't have to continuously reset up curl every single time. Um, I have uh, the base URL for any endpoint that I work with uh, and we set that as just a quick variable and then we have uh, a naming convention that I've come up with that allows us to use natural names for endpoints. So in this instance here, this is all for HubSpot. And HubSpot has a very extensive API. As you can see here, there's a lot of different endpoints that they have. Uh, we also have uh, some variables within these URLs that we need to actually replace items with. Um, <clears throat> all this is getting set up to do is allow us to use function calls through the magic of PHP using um, call, uh, calling in the method here. So in this instance, we can say uh, get all contacts. And what that will do is it will do get all contacts and it will actually call this endpoint here and it'll do most of the magic. And a lot of that magic comes down here within the call function. So we have a match for the front name of the method that we're calling of get all. And if that's true, uh, we do a bit of string manipulation on the function to figure out, okay, get all, we replace it with forward slashes. And we say which section. So we'd say get all contacts and it would actually pull out uh, from our array key value contacts and then get all. Uh, and that's handled mostly in, so this path is handled in the common uh, file here uh, where we have get endpoint here is basically we pass in that giant array. It loops through everything splitting on forward slashes because that's the way that the endpoints get called. And then it actually returns back um, the, uh, uh, the correct endpoint. Uh, this will also do any of those token replacements uh, as well uh, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, that's also passed in. So if you have any of those tokens that need to be replaced, this will also replace the tokens in that URL and actually give you the full URL that you need for handling um, uh, to actually make that call itself. Um, now, again, like I said, I'm lazy. I don't like uh, setting up this a whole bunch of times. So basically, all I have to do for any new endpoint, you see I have several of them here. I've got like Bamboo HR. I've got um, Teamwork. I have uh, some Google stuff I was working with, uh, Copper CRM. Uh, but they're all basically the same. Uh, the way that they're all set up. Uh, so we can take a look at teamwork. Again, we have, you know, companies, get all invoices, get all. So I can say get all people <clears throat> and stuff like that. So I'm, again, I don't like repeating myself over and over if I have to interact with a new endpoint uh, or a new API. And this allows me to quickly and easily add in things. So if the most endpoints return a lot of the same data over and over again, it's just uh, manipulating it slightly. Um, so I don't have to write individual functions to interact with each of these endpoints. I can just write one and then mostly be done. Uh, I do also have as part of uh, some of these, I don't remember if it's in this specific version, uh, but there is a callback method. So if you do have a callback, it will uh, execute that with the result. Uh, and you see here, here's another uh, get options uh, return 
uh, get response. So again, I don't like doing uh, writing code over and over. So we have a get response function, which basically packages up any post or put or uh, thing like that into a variable, <clears throat> sends it off to the curl call, uh, and then does whatever it's going to do and then sends it back, sends the results back to whatever was calling this. Um, so again, I'm very lazy. I don't like doing this. All of my endpoints uh, API calls look exactly the same. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at at this. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share any of the code with you because it's all part of my work code, but that's what I can show you. Um, again, uh, this is me. Uh, this is my email address. If anybody's interested in looking up uh, for me at work. I work for a company called Salted Stone. I don't have any social and I don't have a website. Thanks for listening to me ramble on for about five minutes. All right. Good job. Uh, clap, round of applause, chat. You can clap in the chat if you want to. All righty. Um, so the next person is Dave McGrath. Can you see it? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Cool. So I'm working on building a uh, my first Flutter app. I built this URL shortener a long time ago. Um, it's, in, it's been in prod for a while. Um, I'm starting in a logged in state. This is just hitting my local server. Um, this is kind of where I've gotten to the final page. These are all uh, short links that I have. You can go to, uh, you can't go to any of them because they're on this local server you can't hit. Um, but it works. So the logout happens. I'm destroying my session over on the rail side. And then uh, what I'm doing, let's do a register real quick. Do uh, JavaScript LA at test.com, whatever. Password, we'll just do 3456, because I don't have strong password requirements, because I don't care. And what it did was it registered that user. You can see it dropped it into the database right over here, and then redirected me on the app over to the view. This user doesn't have any, and I haven't built a screen yet for creating links, but that gives us a chance to look at the code. So the Dart code, Dart is very similar to React. Um, so if you know React, you're gonna be pretty comfortable in here. You can see right up top, we're importing a few things that we need, the different components and various things. Uh, my app is Android, because uh, I have an Android phone, so that's where I wanted to start, so it's all material. Um, and you can see, just like React Router, you're gonna set up the routes that you're gonna use. So for my home route, I use this unauthenticated, for logins, you go to the login component, register, register component, and then my new eventually will have a different component, but for now they're both just going to authenticate it. So unauthenticated, when you look at it, you, everything is a widget in Dart. So it's all designed to be displayed out to the screen. So here, every time you always have this build method that does your interface, just like the render method in React. So uh, the scaffold is built in material components. The app bar is the bar across the top. It'll say whatever you want it to say in there. Um, and then centering things, adding a column, putting a row on top of that column with the buttons that I showed you, the login and the register. And then when you press the button, I am pushing to a named route, which is something kind of specific. Uh, there's a lot of different options of pushing and they affect whether or not it comes up as a screen that you can swipe away later with that back arrow or uh, that doesn't exist and it's like a root level, which I use after the registration. I'll show you that. Um, so the register that I just showed you, if we come into register. So I'm gonna jump down just a little because there's a little bit above the register component. And I've got, here's the register component itself. We've got my final string. It's extending a stateful widget. So this is, um, this is how you manage state. Uh, the unauthenticated component was stateless. So you decide that first, and then you actually register state and you build, you do all your build inside your state, which is a little weird, but um, it works. So uh, these are just the various things that I needed to make this happen. And it state is, happens uh, during the constructor phase. Um, and then the underscore refers to uh, like you're doing it within this component only. It's not really a public method, so it shouldn't be called from anywhere else. I don't know. That's a convention I've seen. I don't know how important that is, but these are all things that run um, when, you, when you change things in the form. I have them just clicking off. Uh, validate passwords match. So 
here's the one I want to get to, submit. So submitting is an asynchronous thing, and it's just like async await in React. Um, you're going to, uh, sorry, submit it. I'm setting submitting true, uh, setting the state of a future user, and then I call this create user function, passing it in the email and password. And then after that's done, I push my named and remove until, and that's what gets me back to the root route for the view, so there's nothing to swipe away. And I'm passing an argument of the created user to that route. And so then on the other side of that route, that's a stateful component, and I'll store that user, and then I can refer back to that user and display anything about them on the screen. I also use them to make the API call to get all of the URLs they've shortened. So that create, so the thing that's interesting here is the create user is a future, uh, it's a future. And it's going to return a user, it's a create user function, it takes an email and a password, and then it just does an HTTP post call. Easy as pie, you throw in your URL. Um, because it's, even though it's local, because it's technically not, because it's on a phone, Use this 10022 instead of 127001. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, headers, you pass in your body and it handles it all. See, it's JSON encoded. And then you get your response. And then I'm creating a user from the JSON. This is a factory method I have um, right here. It's a user object. And it just has the things that my API creates on it. And then the decoded response you decode. Uh, if there's errors, you can add errors and that, and then those get handled down in the actual display down here. To display it, you have a future builder. If the snapshot has data, you return the text with the email that was created. This doesn't really get displayed because I immediately move over to the other component. Hey but Dave, um, your um, right. moves like at five. Okay. So that's why I have to share. Okay. That was that was everything anyway. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. If you want to keep going later, you can if you have time. Although we, um, can, you can also just like talk about it in the chat and then. Um, yeah. If anybody's interested, go ahead and hit me up on the Discord. I actually have to fall off pretty soon because I have to put my kid to bed. For sure. All right. Round of applause, please. All right. So next we have Jose Reyes. And he's going to be talking about creating a Postman test script. Hi, I didn't introduce myself earlier, but I'm Jose. I used to work at Bird, and now I'm at a small little startup company called Grandpad. I've been around since 2014, really small company. And I'm just going to, it's going to be short and sweet. Just going to present some uh, testing in Postman. And uh, give me one second. Uh, okay. So uh, at Bird, we usually, we use a lot of uh, Postman to write our backend tests and just create scripts. And so I got this URL from some random factorial website. And so what we're doing here is basically, and we're and, and our prescripts, we're pretty much doing a quick request. And then we're storing that information that we're getting back into a, a variable of factorial. And here we're basically just storing this number six. So when we do make a body, when we go into our body and we send that request over, we're storing, we're sending in the number, number six. And so once that, that goes through, right, then this test is actually executed after we do our, our send. And so on here, we're pretty much going through the statement. If it's a 200, then we're grabbing the data that we get back from our response. And then Postman has built-in functions that you can create your own little test with. And so in this one, for the first Postman, we're expecting our JSON data to have a property of answer, which, which it does. And so that, that goes through. And then on the following line, we're grabbing our, our, our variable that we set in our prescript and we're setting it as number. And so now once we kind of iterate through our data and we're verifying that we're actually getting this uh, 720 as our factorial, we'll double check with Postman and then we'll do a quick PM expect that our answer is equal to our current uh, factorial. And so then, for example, if you were doing backend testing and you wanted to verify not just your, your key, but also your value, then you would pretty much um, store in your, your value or your answer from earlier. And then you would also store the number that you're using to, 
that you're using as a factorial. And then you would verify that through uh, Postman's uh, already built-in function. So we're basically expecting our answer, our property of answer to equal our 720 from our factorial. And so uh, pretty short and sweet. And so that's basically kind of what we did at Bird, just did all of our backend testing through Postman. Since Postman, you're actually able to link this up through Jenkins or any type of pipeline and kind of run cron jobs based on whatever certain amount of time you set. And so for this one, if you were just like basically, I guess if you're working on a project and you want to test your back end, but you don't want to do it all the time, then you can always use the built-in runner that comes with Postman. And then you can run your, run your collection um, when, at whatever given time that you set to run your collection at. And so that, that's pretty much what I was presenting. It was very short and sweet. And it was basically just how you can use Postman and for testing your back end and just verifying your objects, properties, and keys. And that's it for me, guys. Thank you. All right, very good. Another round of applause, please, in the chat. All right, so then next is uh, Adrian Tack on MongoDB Stitch. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen here. All right, can everybody see um, MongoDB Atlas right now? Yes. Awesome. OK, so um, who here has heard of MongoDB Stitch? Either show a thumbs up or use the reaction, shake your head no, nothing? Cool, awesome, that's why I picked this. <laughs> so MongoDB Stitch is essentially um, MongoDB's serverless platform. And what we really try to want to show devs is that um, if you really just don't care about servers or infrastructure and you just need to get an API running or you just need to do an authentication flow or maybe you need functions or triggers for something on your back end, this is a pretty nice platform and suite of tools for you to do so. But rather than me talking about it, I wanted to show you a very simple thing I built literally like uh, right before <laughs> right before this meetup. So um, for the sake of time, I obviously have a couple of things already set up, but um, literally from beginning to end, I will talk to you exactly what I did. So obviously I signed up for an Atlas account, which is free. You don't need a credit card, which is pretty cool. And we have a free, pretty generous free tier. But once you set up um, your project here, so I'm here in my organization, which I called Silicon Desert. And um, I created a project, right, called NHTT. And once I have that, I would create a, um, a cluster, which you would build right here. So this is the cluster that I've already built. The really cool part about this is, you know, when you don't have data to work with, sometimes you can't really see the benefits of these things or even just kind of get your hands dirty. So what's cool here is that you have a, a cool little s sample data set that's already here for you. So that's exactly what I did for this cluster and I've loaded it. So collections, um, if you're not familiar with the document database, collections are essentially like tables. You can think of them as tables without the relational um, relationships, but uh, that's kind of the akin parallel to document databases from the RB DMS world. So we, you can see here has a, lots of really cool collections here. And the one I'm interested in what I used is the sample MFlix um, collection here, specifically movies. So that's the collection, that's my data, cool. Now Stitch, you'll see here in the next tab, what you can do with Stitch is you can connect an application directly to your data. And this is super powerful because a lot of the things that we do that are related to data can be done right here. So you'll see there's a lot of things we can do here. What I wanna show you today is something called a trigger and a function. And you might be familiar with them before. Uh, if you've used Azure functions, like I've used Azure functions, um, since I'm a C-sharp dev, you may have used AWS Lambda functions, super similar. So what I did was, um, essentially what I wanted to do was, if I ever added a movie with my favorite um, actor or actress in it, send me a Twilio message. So I'm like, how hard could that be? So I did it, and so this is what we did. I created a trigger, and essentially the trigger I would create here, uh, we have three types that are currently available in Stitch. We have the database trigger, which means any um, change that has been uh, happening to the database or a specific collection, uh, anything that changes there, you can um, instant, you know, execute, execute a trigger. Something has happened. You want to do something when something has changed in your database. Uh, there's actually two other ones that I didn't use here, but you can use an authentication trigger. For example, if you have a new user or somebody authenticated via, you know, Google login or email and password, 
these ones are great if you want to do like a confirmation flow um, and then a schedule trigger, which is kind of like timed uh, things like cron jobs or timer triggers in Azure Functions. So I want a database trigger. I made a name, I enabled it. Uh, event ordering is just um, if you need to have the specific order with which the um, function or the triggers have been executed to stay intact, you would have this enabled. Otherwise, I turn mine off because I don't care about the order. Uh, by turning it off, uh, it's a slight optimization because if it can do stuff in parallel, it will. And so this is what I did. The cluster that I want to watch is this one. The database I want to watch is, is the Mflix one. And the collection I want to watch is the movies one. And so I said, if any new movie has been inserted, so just on the insert operation, um, I want to trigger a function. Basically, anytime a new document has been inserted into this movies collection, I want to do something. What do I want to do? I want to do this function. And What's even cooler about this is that uh, this advanced option here, you can use match expressions. So you'll see here, <laughs> um, I don't care about any other movies that have been inserted. Uh, the only ones I care about are if in that document that I'm inserting, if Adam Driver is in it or Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot actually, is in it, then I want that notification. And that's cool because that means with this um, expression, if any other documents are inserted that do not have them, it doesn't even move on to the function, which is really valuable because sometimes you get charged you know, for the, the compute resources used anytime it's actually run. So um, only if this matches does it even move on to the function. And we'll go on to our function really quick. And our function here is uh, check for favorite. And um, yep, this is the really quick Twilio service I got. So that's exactly, that's essentially all you had to do. I have some console logged statements in there because I was having an issue earlier. Uh, but it was Jellybrain. I had the wrong ID in my Twilio account. <laughs> and so to test this out super quick, I was just going to add something here. Uh, oops, I'm in Alice. Yeah, a few Good. more seconds to see now. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to test it super quick. Add a really brand new collection here the fastest way I can. Uh, I'm going to insert just for the sake of time. Let's just say title, last Jedi. We're not going to do formalities here. And then the cast is a form of an array. So I'm going to say uh, Daisy. Oops. Ridley and Adam, whoops, driver. Obviously these documents have way more information, but just for the sake of this. So I've inserted it and there we go, I just got it. So I got that a new movie was added, um, what are your favorite has been added. And I think that's super cool that you can have all of this up and running really fast. And that's kind of like a very, very awesome um, overview, I think, of what Stitch can do that's only the surface. And if you have any other questions, come and ask me. <laughs> so thanks for listening. All right, well done, well done. Okay, um, yeah, round of applause, please. Thank you again, Adrian, for coming to JavaScript LA. <laughs> um, and yeah, definitely, you know, if you wanna um, talk about that, you know, in the chat or, you know, come give a talk, everybody as well, you know, not just, um, you know, Adrian, I just wanna make that, clear to everybody, if you felt like you didn't get enough time to say something, you're more than welcome to present, um, you know, in another month or whatever, another week. We can do these Zoom talks as often as um, everybody's okay with that. I was just thinking, you know, maybe if we want to do once a month, uh, that is our regular meetup schedule, but I know some people like to meet more often, so we can also have like a lightning talks maybe every other week or something like that. Um, okay. All right, so almost there. Uh, the last speaker would be me. And so I'll go ahead and do a talk. Uh, I'll finish up our particular presentation today. And it looks like I got some messages in the chat. Um, oh, okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do my presentation now. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about Yarn um, just because uh, this came up a lot like when I was talking to somebody about um, NPM versus Yarn and you know what exactly are the differences. So uh, again, if you want to find me or you know um, information about these slides, they're on slides.com slash JavaScript LA. Uh, but yeah, let's go into it. So uh, yarn is not a ball of yarn that you use to uh, sew your clothes with, 
although that's true in the real world. Yarn is a dependency manager, just like NPM. And basically, it was created around 2016 by teams at Facebook, Google, Exponent, Tilde, and more. Um, the whole idea is that it's supposed to be more secure as well as faster than NPM. And it uses a specialized uh, series of algorithms that you know, help it sort of download in parallel as opposed to uh, more sequential, which is how NPM works. The big problem with NPM is that uh, NPM tends to just download a whole bunch of packages one by one by one, and then some of those packages may auto install, and that's no good from a security standpoint. So that was really why they decided to start working on their own version, as well as they just want something faster, and um, they wanted consistency across different servers. So if I installed things with Yarn, it should work exactly the same when I Yarn install somewhere else. Okay, so um, some people ask like why? Like why do we have to learn so many brand new things in the world of JavaScript? And um, I guess that's just because how the industry works. The industry is pretty much always moving. And so uh, basically say la vie, right? Um, but essentially, uh, you know, if there's a better way to do something, people are going to do that. And so Yarn is an attempt, again, to fix a lot of the issues wrong with NPM. So if you want to use Yarn, you can. If you still want to use NPM, you can. Yarn is meant to just basically be a drop-in replacement for NPM. So whatever you can do with NPM, you can also do with Yarn. And if you want to install Yarn, basically the directions are at this particular URL link. Again, this is on the slides. But if you have a Mac, you can just use Homebrew to install it. If you're on Linux, you can use sudo apt install. And if you're on Windows, you can use an MSI installer. Um, all right, so I'm gonna jump out of this presentation real quick and just show you kind of like how Yarn works. So I'm just gonna use my command line, this fancy purple one. If I type yarn-v, I can see that this is the current version that I'm running, 1.22.4. Then I have some boilerplate code here. I'll just copy it and then um, move this to the side a little bit. And before I press enter, I'll just tell you what it's doing. So it's creating a new directory called my app, and then it's going to see into it, as well as create an index.html file, as well as you know some boilerplate. And then the thing to really note here is this yarn init, because that's really the same as npm init. So if I uh, type yarn init and then dash y, that's the same as npm init dash y, except all the defaults. Otherwise, we have to like press enter every time just to see um, the next statement. All right, so if I want to download something like um, jQuery, as the example shows here, I can just do yarn add jQuery. And it's the same as doing npm install jQuery dash dash save. Uh, but if I want to do dash d, uh, for save dev, then I would use this particular command or dash dash dev. Next, uh, Yarn has this special thing called Yarn Y, and it will just kind of tell you why you installed a particular passage um, package that might be useful for you know, going back in history and just kind of seeing like, okay, why did we install it? Um, it's just because it was specified in dependencies. So if the boss is like, I don't want jQuery, we can just use ES6, then uh, it's really easy to remove jQuery. And the thing to kind of focus on here is that it's super fast, right? Like compare this to NPM. NPM takes a long time to download a lot of packages, but like everything I've been doing has just been pretty quick. So that's really one selling point for Yarn. Um, another thing is like, let's say I don't really know what the latest version of a package might be. Um, let's say I download, you know, gulp at three, um, you know, and later somebody tells me, hey, there's gulp four, you should use that. It's really easy to just do uh, yarn upgrade and then dash dash latest gulp, and then it'll go and download the latest version of gulp. And what you can see here is you get this cat, um, we well, get this new package JSON. That's what's actually happening behind the hood. Yarn is managing your package JSON and then updating you know, your dependencies for you, as well as a yarn lock file. So you don't have to mess with that or the NPM lock. In fact, don't use the NPM lock, use the yarn lock. And then there's yarn list, which lists all of your dependencies. Um, you can zero in on a particular dependency like gulp, because if you write yarn list by itself, um, it will list back everything. And uh, you don't want to scroll up through all of that. So you can use the dash dash pattern flag. 
Um, if you want to run scripts, you'll see this a lot with the React, you know, create React app. You can use Yarn React, uh, Yarn Run, Yarn Run Test, and then Yarn Help. And then I think I'm almost out of time too. So yeah, you're just about out of time. Yeah. I'm going to wrap up here. Basically, if you want to learn more about Yarn, um, you can check out these slides, but essentially um, it's uh, better all around for security and guaranteeing an install that will work on every system. So if you want to learn more, um, you can view the slides.com at slides.com slash JavaScript LA, and I'll put a link to that in the chat. All right. Um, that was the lightning talks. I'm going to stop screen share here. And just like lightning, pretty fast. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this was pretty good. Uh, this is our, again, like our first meetup, so we're just learning to do this online. Um, if you have any questions uh, after the meetup finishes, feel free to just reach out to me uh, directly. You can reach out to me on multiple channels. There's uh, Discord and Slack, as we mentioned. Um, I'm gonna put in the slides uh, for the chat that I just, or the presentation I did. And there's uh, information about me and how to uh, contact me as well in there. And you can also go to javascriptla.net. And then um, if anybody feels like they want to continue presenting or have a chance to present, just reach out to me and we'll um, get you on the schedule for next time. All right, thanks a lot for coming and I will see you guys at the next meetup. Thanks, Vijay. Thanks, Vijay. All right, thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you all for coming.